behind this blurry mess is one of the guns that you have to own to be a true gun guy. Every group of enthusiasts has their list of, if you haven't owned this, then you're not truly a part of the club. You might be a car guy, for example, and the Porsche 911 is a must own. A whiskey guy might say, Eagle Rare. The watch community has been known to say, the Omega Speedmaster. But what about guns? It's a great question. So today on the show, we're gonna be looking at the five essential pistols that every gun guy has to own. The list at the end of the day really should come as no surprise because we as a gun community always agree on everything. I mean, I just can't imagine that the Bursa Thunder 40 could be controversial. He <laughs> <You> dropped it. <laughs> Oh my God! Uh oh! Uh oh! Two malfunctions. Oh no! Three. <laughs> that was a hit. That was a hit. I think that was a hit. Yep. The Bursa is my favorite gun that I own. I'm doing this shit for the Ecuadorian Air Force. Well, here we are. Gun number one. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't really like it. But I don't have to like a thing to acknowledge its place on the list. That's right, everyone. It's the Glock. As you know, it is the 1911 Syndicate, not the Glock Syndicate, which means I am not really a Glock guy. I don't hate them. I certainly don't love them. I tolerate them. <laughs> Fuck you. And the question then becomes, so why put it on the list? And for me, look, it's a clinical pick, right? It's just, strategery, guys, it's just basic shit. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like picking an AR in America. The parts are so readily available. There's so many of them in circulation. They're so easy to work on that it just kind of makes sense. It's just one of those things you got to own. Even if you never really shoot it, right? It's like I've yeah, taking a lot of first time shooters out and oftentimes I have them go get a Glock 19 as their first gun. Why? Because I'm just like, look, man, there's always a market for it. There's a ton of stuff you can do to it if you want, but if you never shoot it, you could probably pick it up 20 years from now and not have touched a damn thing, and it's probably still going to run. Because the Glock motto should be, it's cheap and it works. Perfection, bold motto. I, I don't know that I would go with perfection when it comes to the Glock, but it's cheap and it works. I don't know, I'm just spitballing ideas that the Mark Glock, and, Glock marketing department ever watches this. Just consider, throw it on a t-shirt, see if anyone picks it up. I will order one that's $19.95 from me to you, Glock Inc. Um, it's tough to kill a Glock. They simply work as we tested last year. What the shit? Uh, Seriously? Yeah, take this. Let's, let's function. Jerry, we're out. I'd be shocked if that throw is what killed this Glock. There we go. There. So which Glock do you get? Well, my pick would be a 19. I just don't really think you can go wrong with it. Um, this is a 19, a Gen 5 19 that I own. Only a couple of mods made to it in terms of stippling the grip, which really doesn't need to be done these days. And I've got that Bear Solutions, uh, like a little extended raised mag release and some different sights. But the Glock 19 really is this kind of perfect hybrid of everything. Oh, perfect, perfect. I can't believe I just said perfect when I'm 
referencing a damn Glock. Um, it is a good combination uh, of, of things on this gun that allow it to be um, a duty gun, right? You could have it as a range gun, a bedside gun. You could have it as a CCW gun. It's just kind of in this, I want to call it sweet spot, but sweet spot of like the right size and features where it can do a little bit of everything. Do I love it? No, but can I have the discipline as a shooter and a gun guy to acknowledge that it deserves its place on the list? That much I can. Guys, we'll be back with the video momentarily, but a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video. That would be Wolven. We'll spell it on the screen here so you can get it right. They are a watch dealer in the DFW area, specifically Plano. Um, family owned business, they deal in a lot of high end stuff like uh, Rolex and AP and Patek and IWC and Panerai and all kinds of cool stuff. Check them out, they got a YouTube channel as well, um, but they can help you guys help you guys if you need to uh, sell something, pick up something new. They got a lot of hard to get stuff, some pretty bougie stuff if you're into that kind of thing. Check it out, back on with the show. Coming from Glock, a pistol I don't particularly enjoy, let's shift over to something that I do enjoy. It's the gun that got me into guns. In many ways, my gateway gun. It's the USP. So an HK pistol, you must own it. And I'm less attached to which HK pistol you own. Now I've brought out the USP, we'll talk a little bit about that today, but there's a lot of great options, guys, right? You could do a P30, you could do a Mark 23. I mean, wouldn't that be a gangster? Like one of your five essential guns is an HK and it's the Mark 23, that would just be super cool. You could do a VP9, right? Uh, you could do a P7, that could be so cool. P2000, total sleeper that no one even really thinks about anymore. Even me, I've never owned a P2000, which I do need to rectify, I admit. A P9S, right? But my pick is the USP. So the USP is actually, this bad boy right here is the first gun that I ever bought, except not this particular USP. Um, I, at that time of uh, youth in my 20s, I bought a USP and um, first gun that I bought, I believe it was actually the first gun that I sold as well. And I went down the path that so many went down, which is Glock. And I started getting the Gucci Glocks and all that kind of thing. And now I've come home and I've realized like, look, man, HK pistols are just awesome, right? So. Owning an HK pistol is also cool because HK's never, I don't know if you guys know this, HK's never made a, I believe a gun, but definitely a pistol for the civilian market, right? Every gun, I'm gonna call it gun, but it might might be pistol, but, but every, we'll call it pistol that HK has designed has been designed with professional end users in mind, AKA law enforcement, military units, things like that. And that's cool, right? Because, because of that, they are built like tanks. Even when I took apart the USP last night, just to clean it up a little bit, throw a little oil on it before the shoot today, you're just looking at it and it's, it's so rugged. It's so overbuilt and beefy inside that it just, there's something about it, right? It's just a tank. And in my opinion, the USP is one of the best pistols ever designed. Now, the USP came around in the 90s, and that's kind of in that transitional phase for HK where they're going from the P7 and that basically getting phased out. And they're trying to move into, at that time, like the modern thing, like the modern you know direction everything was going was in polymers and there was... Uh, this increased desire in 40 cal inside of the law enforcement, and all these different things going on. So HK comes out with the USP, Universal Self-Loading Pistol. And one of the cool things about it is it was designed to really be able to be set up for anyone. Very, very modular setup, because what you can do, this is not how this particular USP came. This came as a double to single action gun. Um, that then we swapped over to LEM. So basically, hey, look, you can take a USP, how most of them standard come, is with on this side for a right-handed shooter, you've got a uh, decocker, and I believe it's also a thumb safety. I only say that because obviously I don't run mine that way, but I think it functions both as a safety when we go up, 
decocker as we go down. So you can carry the USP in a double to single format where, hey, first round heavy uh, double action trigger pull, and then you go into single action from there. But because of the, the, the joint decocker and safety, you can run this thing like a 1911, right? You can carry USP cocked and locked, right? And then come, you know, gun comes out, presenting the gun, thumb safety comes off, right? And then you rock and roll. Or you can do what I do with, I think all of my HKN, not a Mark 23, but um, my P30 and uh, USP, swap it over to the LEM or the law enforcement modification, where it basically takes your trigger and it converts it into double action only, except for all the double action is very, very soft and then you just ride the reset after that, right? So that's how I prefer to run them. USP was also the first pistol that had a integrated pistol light rail. Now, some of the people that like to complain about the USP are, are like, well, it, you know, yeah, but it, it's not a light rail that you can actually run any current lights on. Sure, and I don't care. I don't care because it's like, look, man, use this gun where it fits in your life. And if you need a light bearing gun, first of all, you can still get the lights, but they just probably run you a fortune. The ones from, from inside, I believe it was. But it's like, dude, just get a light bearing gun if you need to do light bearing shit. Like a lot of times I don't need a light on a gun. And it was also, it's got the classic HK paddle, right? So it's got the paddles. That way this is set up universally for lefties, righties. Like it's a gun that's so modular and so well designed. It's a tank, but it works for everyone. For those of you that like old school mechanical things, this sound will be both pleasing and a dead giveaway. You gotta own a revolver. comes to revolvers, I am a little bit more opinionated on this. I'm really of the mindset, you gotta have a Colt. Um, you just gotta have a Colt revolver, right? And there's a couple different directions you can go. If you were only gonna have one, I really do think you should have two revolvers. But if we can't play that game and you gotta have just one, I'm like, okay, cool. You could go detective special. Like, isn't a Colt detective special? Like, this is fantastic, guys. This used to be a duty gun for detectives and shit like that. Really, isn't that cool? Shoulder holster. Don't you want a shoulder holster for that? Like, it's a gun that has so much personality. You know, it's funny shooting this earlier. I haven't shot this gun in a long time. And like, after a couple of rounds, right, just kind of modifying your grip um, for revolver shooting, like, you you know, the gun's moving around where you're like, all right, you know, with this little tiny grip, it's like you only even get a couple of rounds off before you got to readjust your grip. But it's so much fun to shoot, right? God knows where these sights are pointing after like 60 years. Um, but you could go detective special or, in my opinion, I think the definitive answer is you gotta do a snake gun. And the snake gun that I think probably universally, even the, and I should apologize to any of the Colt fans, I know you guys are like super hardcore, so don't take anything I say, uh, I guess take it all with a grain of salt, and anything I get wrong, please do not execute me Colt form. You gotta do a snake gun, and the snake gun would be the Colt Python. And when I say that, I mean preferably an old one, like a classic, you know, old school Python. This one from the 1960s is a gun I've owned for a long time, actually a gift from my dad. And I very, I haven't probably shot this gun in, uh, I don't know, a couple years prior to today, and it's just really cool. And also, I mean, for a gun from the 60s, incredibly nice shooting. There's some different links you can get. This is the four inch, uh, there's, six inch, uh, I don't know if they ever made these in threes. I know on the current pythons, they've got like, I think five inch, six inch, they got a three, they got a four. I think they even got like a two and a half, like they went nuts. And honestly, I've never shot the new ones, but I gotta admit, actually the new ones are pretty appealing. I don't know that they have the same craftsmanship as the old ones, but it's like, man, if you're going revolver, doesn't a Colt Python just feel right? Like, isn't that just an absolutely amazing gun? Like, it just makes me happy. I never shoot these things, but I would feel incomplete as a collector and a gun guy without them. And that's the thing, you know, it's not every gun you own has to make sense in a modern shooting context. Sometimes it's just the way that gun makes you feel 
And that's enough. That alone can be enough. We'll be back with video momentarily. Another thanks to uh, the other sponsor of today's video, that would be FLP Firearms Legal Protection. They've been with us for a long time now. Appreciate that. They basically provide self-defense oriented insurance for you guys. So when it comes to unlimited attorney fees, an attorney hotline, right? If you get into a bad situation, you're not really looking to talk to a customer service line. You're like, hey, I need an attorney here, bro. Like, hey, Susan on, on, on line three on the customer service, get, can I get an attorney, please? That's who picks up, not Susan. The actual attorneys who picks up when you call the hotline. You keep a little card in your wallet, um, and that's who you call. They got a few different plans, um, whether you have family, if you travel a bunch, if you stay mostly in your state. Um, so you can check that out. We've got a link below. Um, great service. Uh, me and Chris have both had it for a long time now. So again, link down below. Uh, there's a code there. You guys can save a chunk off of the different memberships. Appreciate them. And then the final thank you. It's not even a thank you. It's just us. We're a small business, the 1911 Syndicate. Um, hey, we're here to help you guys with real estate, um, operate largely here in uh, Utah where I live. But um, if you guys are in other parts of the country, you can uh, hit us up and if we can help you, great. Um, if you have dogs that lean on you like this, I don't know if we can help you. We definitely can't help your dog. Your dog's just not very well trained. Um, but hey, check us out, 1911syndicate.com. We've also got the Patreon linked below. I know this is a lot of stuff hit with you guys, so let's get back on with the video. When I first came up with the idea for this video, I actually came up with the five guns reasonably quick, and much to my sadness, there was one gun on the list that I did not personally own. And that sounded like as good of an excuse as any to pick up a Beretta 92 FS. Now, I recently bought this Beretta 92 FS from the top Beretta salesman in the state of Utah. I'm the number one Beretta salesman in the state of Utah. Not confirmed. And he tried to convince me to get a nicer variant, and I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, not today, son. I said, I want a 92 FS. Bone friggin' stock, that's the gun that I want. Zero frills, and that's what I got. That's what I got. I bullied them into selling me this gun, right? It's just, you know, it's amazing what happens if you offer to pay someone for a gun. Sometimes they actually just sell it to you. Um, so, look, here's the reality. I will not, I, I will not modify this. I will not even truthfully shoot it that often. But there's going to be occasions where I'm so thrilled that I have this gun. What would the occasion be? Oh, I don't know. You ever heard of a thing called Christmas? You tell me that when John McClane's laying it the fuck down, sorry, apologies to family, but you tell me when John McClane is laying it the fuck down on Hans and Carl and the whole damn gang there, you tell me you don't want to look over on your sofa or on your coffee table and you see this 92 FS laying there. You tell me you're not going to be like, yeah. Yeah, you tell me you might not just hold it a little bit. You might not crawl under a table and just act like you could shoot through the table. Absolutely. It's much like a therapy dog, right? There's, you know, they accomplish basically nothing, but there's just those moments where you want them in your life. They, they just make you feel good. Now, aside from the nostalgia side of this, which is largely why I bought it, you may want it for other reasons. You may say, hey, look, I'm going to take this and I'm going to make this a modern shooter. I'm gonna send it over to someone like uh, Langdon Tactical would seem to be like the no-brainer that you would send this to and they're gonna trick it out with, you know, dots and, you know, better triggers. Trigger could definitely be improved upon. Um, but it's like, hey, you could go that route. This gun might also have significance to you because uh, of a tie to the military. Maybe you're in the military for a long time and perhaps you didn't even like this gun in the military, but you're a little bit nostalgic now and you're like, I want a 92 FS. But when it comes to a fusion of classic romanticism with modern functional performance, there can be but only one gun left to talk about. Number five should come as no surprise to anyone because it's in our show's name. It's the 1911. And 
It's the only gun on this list I feel truly passionate about. Because it's America's pistol and you simply must own a 1911. Nineteen elevens and watches have a ton in common, both from a historical perspective and a mechanical, purposeful connection, but also from the lens of weight. What I mean by that is for people that are used to wearing like an Apple Watch or a G-Shock Garmin, something like that, when they pick up their first steel mechanical watch, typically on a bracelet, they almost all have the first reaction, which is they're like, wow, the weight, and they kind of hold it. It's almost like the same thing when someone picks up gold for the first time, right? And they'll have a gold ounce coin or something, they pick it up and they're like, wow, the weight of it. And there's, there's this sense of like, wow, this thing must be significant. Much in the same way that someone picks up a clock, right, which is largely a plastic gun, and you're like, okay, yeah, you know, reasonably feels like a toy. And then you pick up this five inch railed 1911 and you're like, nah, that's a gun. That right there, is a gun. Now, I'm not loyal to which particular 1911 you should own. I think that that's a personal choice and there are so many great options out there. A lot of it depends on your uh, budget and your purpose behind it and all kinds of different things. So pick whatever makes you happy at the end of the day. I brought you a couple of uh, models and references here that have a little bit of sentimental value to me. Um, so I'll just show you those briefly. So this is the Cabot Nero. The reason this uh, gun means something to me is Cabot was the first company that ever gave me a chance. Um, it was brand new. We had just started doing gun content. I mean, we were maybe like a month, two in, uh, something like that. And, you know, it, and I was a customer of theirs, uh, an existing customer on a gun that I own. And they were nice enough to just loan me some guns that, it, that we could do videos on. And the videos were probably horrible. I don't even think I could bring myself to watch those videos because they were probably just so underprepared that I don't even know if I could stomach watching our old content. But, you know, I, I, I got this Nero from them, you know, at the end of doing some, some videos and everything. And it was just like, hey, that's the first company that took a chance on me. And this is, you know, this is the thing that I sort of have to commemorate that. The other gun that I brought out is my Wilson Protector 2, Wilson Combat. And um, the Protector for me is kind of a cool gun because Wilson wasn't the first company that gave me an opportunity, but they were pro I, I believe they were the first company where I had zero connection. I was just a dude that reached out to them and said, hey, we're the 1911 syndicate. I love 1911s uh, and I'm probably very brand new and raw at this. I probably left that out of the email and just said, hey, I'd love to do a review on a gun. And they uh, they let me do a review on this gun. And then at the end of it, they offered to let me buy it, you know, for a favorable price. It was a used gun. And I was like, for real? And, uh, and I bought it, you know? So for me, this does have some per personal significance of like, hey, this is the first gun that I ever bought after we started doing reviews. And Wilson Combat knew nothing about me and said, sure, sure, kid, we'll give you a shot. I would also tell you, look, don't get blinded by, I, I, I'm aware these are a couple of expensive guns and don't get blinded by that. Owning a 1911 is not some like rich guy's game or something like that. It's like, look, man, there is a full spectrum here. Like it's a game for people that love guns and love America. That's who the 1911 is for. And here's how I know you guys agree with me about the 1911. To date, we've never had a viral video, something I consider a blessing in many ways. But our most viewed video to date is still a video called Why 1911s? And I made that video um, with the expectation that no one would watch it. It was like, hey, look, I love 1911s and I would love to try to make some sort of video to convey to people why I think they're, they're interesting and significant in the confines of the country that we live in. And so we made this Why 1911 video that still gets views and I still see comments pop in all the time of grown men saying, hey, I, I cried watching this video. And instead of me trying to come here and litigate the case for 1911s and everything, we're just gonna end with a little bit of footage from that video. So roll tape. Now his next point has to do with what he refers to as mechanical purity. And I found this to be such a well-made argument. 
Rob says, to understand 1911s requires an appreciation of mechanical construction. The 1911 style pistol design requires very precise hand fitting by craftsmen in order to perform with great accuracy and reliability. Modern pistols, such as your big box polymer brands, were designed with modern manufacturing standards in mind where components can be easily mass produced with low cost methods and then simply assembled by virtually anyone and generally speaking, they will work. There's no real craft to it aside from a functionally engineered mechanism. Not all folks appreciate how an object is made. Some will look at a Casio G-Shock digital watch and say it tells them time, and very well at that. And therefore, there's no reason to spend more than $41.95 on a watch. Others appreciate a finely crafted, complex mechanical watch where the art of watchmaking involves highly skilled movements to interface very precisely and with great complexity to function correctly. Both the digital watch and the mechanical watch will tell time, but how they get there and the effort and human time and skill in each is distinct. A well-made 1911 is mechanical art in the form of a handgun. The physical beauty of the gun. A design that has looked good for a hundred years will still look good in another hundred years. Elegant flowing lines, artful function, and timeless beauty. It will continue to be valued. The 2011 will be valued by no one in another century. And Rob's point that I found so beautiful, it's the fucking hero weapon. Beyond a firearm, the 1911 is the archetype of handguns, the weapon for the hero, and the American experience of greatness. The hero in literature is the one that adventures off to confront the unknown and returns the victor and this is the case of the 1911 in its use in World Wars I and II. Earlier generations who fought to preserve American ideals carried and used the 1911, and did it at a time when the handgun was far more relevant in battle than it is today. Light, easy to handle, effective. The handgun is the ideal weapon for both defensive and offensive close quarter man-to-man -man combat fights. We stand on the shoulders of our forefathers, and the connection we can still experience is, in effect, the same weapon that served. When you hold the 1911, you hold the hero's weapon where America prevailed in the confrontation of evil in the Great Wars. It's a tangible connection to our past, which forges the identity of who we are. Now, as stated, I've got my own reasons why I still believe that 1911s hold this incredible place for any gun owner. And I know, that, look, I can never win this argument with you based on reason and logic. For me, it's an argument that's far more centered around an emotional argument. See, 1911s for me, it's, it's the gun for people who have a little bit of old school in them. I equate it to, look, two cars can pull up to the stoplight. You might have a new McLaren and a 69 Charger. And as cool as that new McLaren is, you know which car is classier and which one's gonna get infinite more eyeballs. People are gonna take their photo with that 69 Charger. It's the same thing with knives, as I've been getting into knives lately. There's something, while I appreciate the modern mechanical knives, that are laser cut and all that jazz. I mean, there's something cool about it, but I'm telling you the experience of going and participating in forging a knife from nothing, taking blank steel and making it into something. And within that there's imperfections and there's personality in it. There's something about that, that if you don't understand it, I don't know that I can make you understand it. See, for me, when I see 1911s, I just don't see a gun. I see something that is this living, breathing thing. It has a soul, and while it's a physical, tangible object, it's an object that actually moves me. A beautiful 1911. I mean, a real, genuine, beautiful 1911 is way more than a gun. It's a historical statement. And I cannot tell you that once ever in my life, as much as I love firearms, I've ever picked up a polymer weapon and said that's a piece of art, and historical art at that. It is simply a tool. A 1911 is a tool that has a history and it has a soul. And if you've never tested that out, go check out a high-end 1911 sometime and tell me it's not the best thing that you ever shoot. God 
God damn, that's well written. And cut that part out. But God damn, man knows how to write. I was like, Rob, you gotta write a fucking book, man. You know how to write shit. Mm-hmm.